All right, we have returned to open session. All right. Um, and so the next item on the agenda is public comment. We apparently have uh, someone in person this evening. Stephen, well, 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 I'm sorry, Walinga or Wal Okay, yes, it's, got it right the first try, great, <laughs> thanks. Uh, yes, uh, Stephen, if you'd like to come and, and uh, speak over at that microphone, uh, if you could state where, where you're from, that would, that's, uh, would be great. Otherwise, it's your option. Uh, and if you could uh, limit your comments to three minutes, that would be appreciated as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate the uh, effort that the school board has made during the summer to create the school schedule. But I also realize that there are some things that may have uh, been overlooked. I refer to uh, the agenda 6.255, assemblies and ceremonies. I have here an example of one uh, government's opinion of ceremonies and assemblies. Uh, town of Cicero on uh, September the 16th they have listed the Mexican Independence Day also Friday the 17th the Mexican Independence Day the uh, Saturday the 18th the Mexican Independence Day as well as the Seguin flea market and on Sunday the 19th the Seguin Flea Market from 9 to 3, the Mexican Independence Day Parade, and the Mexican Independence Day. I went by the park in Cicero, found the uh, carnival on the north side of uh, 26th Street, and the uh, park uh, all enclosed for the celebrations. But I'm wondering what uh, you have considered for assemblies and ceremonies. Now I noticed that the uh, Independence Day is tomorrow. I don't know if the board has any interest in uh, even mentioning the uh, activity. But on September the 17th, on Friday, there is a uh, poor uh, interest in the assembly or celebration of a particular event. That event is September the 17th, 1787, and that is the date where the U.S. Constitution was ratified by the uh, people in committee. And it was committee members went back to their states, respective states, to either ratify or reject the uh, Constitution of the United States. I'm happy to announce that Delaware was one of the first to uh, accept that. So I'm wondering if uh, the board would consider either generally announcing to the students in the morning on the 17th that the uh, Constitution was started to be ratified or whether an assembly or a celebration might be in order. Um, Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Walinga. All right. Is there any further public comment? There is not. All right. Uh, then next up are uh, are there any proposed uh, changes to the agenda? Right. Uh, let's see. If not, the next item 
Uh, we have listed here as a public hearing on transfer of funds to non-operating funds, and I believe we've been informed of a uh, legislative, an expiration of, uh, of a legislative, uh, what, a rule that uh, is impacting our, some of the proposed transfers we had on the agenda tonight that we will not have uh, this uh, public hearing. It's no longer necessary. All right, uh, so that brings us to the next item, which is the superintendent's report. Thanks, Dan. Just a couple things that I wanted to cover. Um, we know that uh, as a Board of Education, myself, um, we carefully monitor all of our enrollments, particularly at this, time of, at this time of the year. So I just have our enrollment update for all of you to take a closer look at. Um, you can see it's my goal that we never have more than 25 children in the class. We know we don't have a tight policy on class size. It's a number we've kind of looked at as a threshold we prefer not to cross. And certainly if we had to for just the way uh, numbers would come in, we would look at additional supports for a class. Um, but right now we do not have more than 25 students in any of our classes. We have classes that are enrolled right up to that and um, 24 students in a number of our classes. Second and fourth grade seem to be the the most enrolled grade levels this year, um, in, aside from the middle school, I should say, where their overall grade levels are higher than that. But um, again, we continue to address our flexible boundaries and look at expanding Blythe to a true two-section school over time. And um, we do believe that is certainly helping with some of the crowding that we have. You know, that has, again, sort of meeting our goal of reducing that overcrowding at Central. So I wanted to share that. Um, the other thing I wanted to share, um, perhaps maybe more of a immediate interest right now is the participation rate in our saliva screening. So you have that data. As you know, the, um, the board is very instrumental in moving forward with an opt-out process. So the idea that all children are opted into the process unless parents explicitly opt um, the child out. And I think that did do a lot to increase our overall percentage of participation. Uh, the saliva screening just started today. So it's been um, a process of organization and working with the University of Illinois SHIELD program and then what they have done in um, the area, the different school districts that they've subcontracted with a healthcare partner to actually come in and do the screening. So today they started at Ames. They'll be at Central and Hauser tomorrow. And they're also at Hollywood today. And then they'll be at Blythe on Friday. They're kind of making some stops at the schools to make sure they're fitting in the AM and PM kindergarten classes as well. Um, Unfortunately, I know they didn't finish in four different classrooms today. It was sort of a larger group than they had fully anticipated. Things just took a little longer. Um, I will share with you that is what I'm hearing from other superintendents, too, that everything just takes a little longer than anticipated, whether it's kids' reticence in terms of participation or just taking longer literally to fill the fairly large test tube. Um, but again, the team uh, that came from Visit Health, Health Visit Healthcare is our uh, partner that's doing it with us. Again, just really positive, um, very flexible in their approach. Um, I came over here when they were actually doing the uh, early learner saliva screening and uh, watched three and four year olds stand right out here in the little hub and spit into their tubes. And they were just being cheered on by this team and they were slowly but surely filling up their tubes. I was very concerned that they were about to spill it all right back out. But, um, <laughs> Anyway, the process is underway, and again, things are, um, you know, the, going relatively well. We're, we're pleased with, with the partnership we, we have with VISIT, and we're pleased with the, so many parents that have opted into the process or um, haven't opted out, I should say, and also just being flexible and knowing that this is, is not a perfect solution. And we are trying very hard to balance the, the value of this as a safety mitigation along with really not wanting it to interrupt instruction. So... Um, it's a challenge, and we appreciate where kind of everybody is as we learn. They said eventually we'll get to a point you won't even know we're here. <laughs> like, okay, we'll, we'll look forward to that. So, so I think it's going to take a little like, bit of time. Oh, I just What's have a question. Is, do you think the slowness was because of the newness? I mean, do you think that had something to do with the fact that it took longer than they've been hearing? I mean, this is day one. Yeah, and I think new in every aspect. Like, right. even though they had done a walk through the building, they found the building to be more complicated than they thought. I'm sure the kids were like, this is what I'm supposed to do, you know? So I think it was all of the above. It was their logistics, but it was also um, children. But like some grade levels moved really quickly. So 15 yeah. minutes, they were in, they were out. Um, so again, we just keep looking at different processes too. And as they're also learning from other school districts. Like actually, it might be helpful to bring a larger group out. Like we kind of thought we'd pass three children sort of out into the hallway and right back in. And they're like, really? Some schools are sending us the whole class. Everybody does it all at once and it almost goes faster. So they'll keep trying and we'll keep trying and I'm sure it'll just continue to get better. 
I should note, I think uh, my daughter was one of the four-year-olds uh, that we encountered yes. <laughs> today. Given our experience at home last year for, for three as a three-year-old, I'm really encouraged to hear that things went relatively well. I know we was definitely uh, an issue some mornings getting enough spit. So yeah. <laughs> glad that glad yeah. that things seemed to go well for the first day. Yeah. Yeah, and you know they're scaling up. I, I don't know how many school districts of the 850 some odd school districts in Illinois, but they, you know, seem to be doing work everywhere. So I, I can't imagine their operations that they're addressing right now. So, um, Mike, so sorry, yeah. do you mind if I ask a question or Not at all. a comment on this? So yeah, really pleased to see some of the high percentages. Interesting to see how some of like the fifth grade percentages are, are so drastic. I assume that to be the case in junior high because perhaps of the vaccination of. Right. Some of the students at the junior high level. I guess my question is: There are certain classrooms. My my child, uh, my children also participated in it today. There's some classrooms where perhaps maybe one or two children opt out, and it becomes fairly obvious to the children who that child might be. So, you know, I want to be sensitive yeah. to a child whose whose family made that determination right. for them, and sort of potentially how they might be either treated by their peers or talking points that are given yeah. to teachers on how to guide. Like if the students ask, well, why isn't this kid getting tested? You know, yeah. helping our teachers be able to navigate those yeah. conversations. Uh, yeah. That that was just that was kind of like the first thing that was reported to me. Like, who didn't? But yeah. you know, so we'll yeah. have a conversation <laughs> yeah. about that. So, yeah. Not yeah. Too much yeah. 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 Okay. But you know, I was just wondering if if they asked the teachers the same. So yeah, that just uh, struck me based off them. Yeah, and we, we talked about that. We, you know, we don't want children to feel isolated or left out. Um, yeah, so I think it's going to be a kind of also a work in progress. And certainly we'd want families to let us know if they feel their child is being sort of ostracized or, you know, made to feel sort of badly about their decision. I mean, we want to support families' decision. We do want to encourage people to participate, but we know it's not something that 100% of our families want to do or feel comfortable with. Uh, I, I, I can appreciate what Stephanie is saying, but, I mean, this is a... I mean, this is something, I mean, we're in a pandemic. I mean, we're trying to get rid of, trying to get through this. And so I, I want to be sensitive to the kids, but I, I am a little disappointed to, to Stephanie's point that I, I'm sort of surprised the fifth grade is actually as low as it is for the participation. I would have hoped that um, it would have been higher, uh, but I mean, I, I would, I, I'd hope that the people who opted um, out of this would opt back in because there is, I mean, just based on what's going on in other school districts uh, throughout the nation, we are, I mean, kids, these kids are getting sicker. And I mean, um, these kids are getting sicker and we, we know about this. So I just would hope that people would maybe reconsider these their decisions to opt out and opt back in. Mm -hmm. Every of the elementary were either 90 or very close to yeah. 90. Mm -hmm. That was a really great percentage of parents that decided to. And yeah, the junior high, I, I was guessing too that it would be that oh, they thought maybe if they're vaccinated, then they don't. I, I do wonder, need to yeah, that might be impacting the numbers. Yeah, that one makes more sense to me. But yeah, that fifth grade one is great. Mm -hmm. Having vaccinated siblings, is that what you're saying? That they themselves could be vaccinated at Hauser. Um, yeah, at Hauser, yeah, I think that definitely. I mean, a number of families would send us the opt out form and say, because my child's vaccinated. Right. I mean, you know, so. Mm -hmm. But the others but, look but, really but good. <laughs> it should be pointed, though, that the seventh and eighth graders have a higher participation rate than the than fifth graders. Grade. Yeah, that's so. strange. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I think your point is a good one too. From you know, as I much as I continue to remind people they can opt out, people could opt back in. Right. Certainly. Yeah. Or if they'd chosen not to, yeah. and I think, I think there are some people we know that are just reticent to to have their child's saliva collected. It feels strange. I think other people were worried about maybe the impact on instruction, and so if you know, as it becomes a smooth operation, um, you know, maybe there are people that'd be willing to to come back in or to join into the process. Mm -hmm. So we'll keep those options out there and available and um, in our communications. The other thing I just want to add is COVID communication. So as you recall, last year up until about, I don't know if it was, I don't remember what, exact, what month it was, I used to send out a notification about every single COVID case. Other districts were doing that also. We then decided that we would keep all of our COVID data in a COVID dashboard. Right now it's more of a chart um, because just in terms of looking at our, our overall numbers, the chart seemed to be the better way to 
to identify and describe that. It is something that we update now every Friday, um, but I do just want to share, because tonight's a board meeting night, that we've had six cases all totaled in the district since the start of school. Um, two cases at Ames, one at Blythe, zero at Central, two at Hollywood, and one at Hauser. So there are a couple new cases from this week that aren't necessarily on the dashboard yet. They'll be updated on Friday. Um, we are just from a COVID communication. Um, if a child is identified as positive for COVID, they do get an individual notification directly from the school nurse. Um, if they're considered a close contact, they get a, a notification directly from the school nurse. And then the classroom or the grade level gets a notification that there was a child um, identified with COVID in your child's classroom or in your child's <coughs> grade level. Um, your child is not a close contact, or if they were a close contact, you would have already heard from us. So there's kind of three layers that we're communicating with everybody, and then the fourth being just updating it on our dashboard chart weekly. So um, we do want to make sure that we're being as clear as possible, but we also didn't feel that the, the all district notification of a single case was um, something that was necessary. So that is the superintendent's report for tonight. Actually, can I, can I just go back to a question sure. I, with this alive and screaming? When the test, when they're, I know they're, they're going to turn around like within 24 hours. When do we have an idea? I'm assuming they contact you if there's been a positive case. I mean, right, you only get notified if there's right. a positive. There is a way that you can go in. I believe as a parent, you'll be given a code to go in and if you just want to look and make sure that your child's like test results were recorded, mm -hmm. um, assuming they're negative. So I can make sure that that's clear to everybody how to do that. But, but if that's, it's sort of the no news is good news. Right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they're saying 12 to 24 hours. And I've heard they're really good with the 24. Mm -hmm. And I know for Blythe Park that's going to test on Fridays, they said that means over the weekend. So there'd be a notification mm -hmm. on Saturday. Any other questions about any of that? I also just want to applaud our school team, even though they're not actually doing it. Our school secretaries, our principals, you know, it's um, it's a big uh, it's a big occurrence within the within the school day right now. Very much so, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But no. as with anything, I'm sure the more that it's done, the more procedures will get put in. You know, laid down and, and everyone will know what they're doing and things will go pretty fast. And again, I think things like if there were to be an outbreak and the Department of Public Health, as you know, defines an outbreak as two okay. cases, only two, um, that are linked, that are in the same classroom, um, that they would come then and do outbreak testing. And I've heard other superintendents that have had that situation, um, they really kind of all hands on deck and they get that done for you and that's a great way to monitor with that idea then that kids can stay in school with frequent um, testing and screening as opposed to last year's you know it was let's close the class down or maybe close the whole school down so again um, I think just tremendous efforts being made to keep kids in school you know as much as we possibly so can. So when you say they would test to say would, would you then, then have IDPH people communicating with the SHIELD people in those increased testing protocols yeah. for those that might have been in the yeah. area so as, as a matter of fact just um we we almost thought we did have an outbreak case and we actually had a unique situation we communicated to the school um, where a student was initially identified through a quick test and then two pcr tests not not okay. covid okay. um so i was had looked into all our outbreak procedures and so that you do you know, notify the Department of Public Health or the Department of Public Health notifies you, it's more likely we notify them. Mm -hmm. And then they say you immediately contact SHIELD. So they have a direct relationship with them and SHIELD just sets up outbreak testing. Great, yeah, I hadn't seen the tree for that yet. Yeah, okay. the tree is not out yet. And okay. that's been a, <laughs> a huge frustration to school personnel that the why this exclusion tree is not um, gotcha. published and available. We're, we still, I think, have the old one published. Yeah, that was the one question. <laughs> yeah, Thanks. everyone's been asking for it. Okay. Yeah. There's some symptoms not listed on the old one that are on our like attestation. So some parents have been bringing that to attention. Mm -hmm. um, I and think then runny nose came off as a symptom. Yes. Right. Yeah. Well, so we yeah. got sent yeah. home with our sibling too for okay. runny nose. So there's just been you know yeah. I know we're all working it out. But have we um, continued to have discussions, or might it still be the case where we do sort of that that test to test to stay, yeah. um, you know, 
map testing. Oh, my stomach hurts. Right. Okay, go home, right. get, come back with the PCR test, sibling goes yeah. home. So have we begun exploring that? Is that still an option? Yeah, we've started to explore it. You have to have your SHIELD program well established okay. Okay. to have a test to stay protocol. But the idea is, I think people understand, so the idea of if you're close contacts at lunch is sort of our you know, biggest worrier because kids do have their mask down. Right. Um, then kids could participate, children could participate in a test to stay protocol where the test on like days, what is it, Pam? One, three, five, seven. And rather than going to have to quarantine at home, if they stay symptom free, they could be okay. tested. But again, we have to, they could be tested and be able to stay in school. But we don't have our program established yet. Okay. In terms but that would of our be regular first. screening. I think the idea is that if you have regular surveillance going on at high participation rates, and then you have an exposure. Rather than sending everybody home, or even just the close contacts home, you do this test to stay protocol. But you have to have had that good surveillance in place already. And who decides what's well when it when it is well established? What's that? Who decides when it's well established? That's a good question. I would say <laughs> Shield decides. Shield decides. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. I don't so know if that means two weeks in or four weeks in or. Um, I would imagine less than a month. Yeah. I would hope, but yeah. Okay. So test to stay would be for children who are determined to be close contacts, not necessarily a child who reports to the nurse's office with a headache or a stomach ache. Right. Test to stay is for close contacts. Yeah. I will say, I had a child with a runny nose and we kept her home and we got all the tests, but I will say there is one little glitch where you know how if your child, let's say your child's positive and they're gone for 10 days, they have remote instruction and all those things. There is a gap in the instruction for those children that are waiting for their final yeah. PCR test email. Um, we waited four days for the results. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. A long time, um, even after calling the number and knowing you couldn't get through. And so there is a, I, I noticed there is a policy gap because, you know, you say, can my child participate remotely? But the answer was no. The policy only says if you have COVID. And so I think that's something we can <laughs> Just a personal experience we could look into. Yeah, like and your that. child's not the only one. And I actually yeah. think there is a little bit of a gap that we have to reassess. And in yeah, our she didn't protocol. have COVID, but right. she was home for almost four days yeah. um, because of it, just because yeah. it was a cold. So it was just not officially like, under quarantine, but could have been under quarantine yes. being tested. Mm -hmm. And um, right. so we're going to take a look at that. The other thing I'll, I'll sort of hope, plan, assume is that shield testing is in place. We could do shield testing. And right. shield has said that they've even had you know parents say, I'll pull up in front of the school door. I'll meet you outside. Can we do a quick saliva do screening? Yeah. Because it is now, um, yeah. and you all know this, it's, it's considered PCR diagnostic testing. So it yeah. is sort of considered that gold standard of diagnosis. So, um, so that's also another great piece of this. We also received today um, a box full of our Binex quick tests, okay. um, which are not you know, understood to be as accurate. And again, just looking at what the protocol would be and what I'm hearing is if you have shield, if you have the saliva option, you would go with the saliva option as right. opposed to the quick test option. Right. So again, we're really eager to get this yeah. firmly established in the system. And I, I think your question is a great one about, you know, what does it mean to be sort of fully established? No, I, will, I will ask them that question. No, and the staff so. said, no, you're not the only one. We have, and yeah. the nurse said, no, there are a bunch of people waiting three yeah. to five days, and it seems even longer than last year for some reason. Yeah. But yeah, um, well, I was all the kids I are going. That, yeah. that, no, it, it was really like she could have been connecting in with her class and listening to the teacher instructions. But, yeah. You know, one of those things I thought, wow, there's a weird policy issue here. Yeah. But, um, you know, it's, it's all good. I mean, you survive, but it's just a little Well, it's bit. good that you brought that up, because that definitely sounds like know. something that we could take a look yeah, at. Yeah, and for the only one, fine, but if there's future. a bunch of people, then we can fix it. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. Thanks. All right. I'm good. Thank you. All right. That takes us to the next item, which is the uh, consent <coughs> agenda. Can the board secretary uh, review the contents of tonight's consent agenda? Sir, tonight's consent agenda consists of meeting minutes from three previous meetings, August 4th, 2021, closed session and a special meeting, and August 18th, 2021, minutes of the regular business meeting. Personnel report as presented, the payables pre-list as of August 31st, 2021, payables pre-list as of September 15th, 2021, the EIS Administrator and Teacher Salary and Benefits Report for 2021 and the Eklund Consulting Agreement, which we had some dialogue about um, at the last meeting. All right. Thanks, Wes. Uh, at this time, is there a motion that the Board approve the consent agenda as presented? So moved. Second. All right. Uh, Kathy, can you call the roll? 
Mr. Barsavi? Aye. Mr. Mayorhead? Aye. Ms. Gunn? Aye. Ms. Kleiber? Aye. Ms. Murphy? Aye. Mr. Marvel? Aye. And Mr. Hunt? Aye. Motion passes. All right, uh, then next is uh, board member comments. Are there any board member comments this evening? Well, I for one will say that uh, my kids are on the younger side, at least the kids in D96 are on the younger side, so they're <laughs> really excited about being back in school. Oh, for sure. Uh, really happy with, with their classes. Uh, my first grader is amazingly excited about two recesses during the day. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wonderful thing, wonderful thing. Uh, and it's, it's uh, yeah, just great to have everybody back and uh, great to see that we're off to such a great start this year. All right. Uh, and that will take us to committee reports. Uh, first committee listed, <clears throat> excuse me, is uh, the policy committee. Um, from the policy committee just thanks to everybody again for helping review the under the initial reading of the press plus release um, at our last committee of the whole meeting I know those items are up um, for action later under old business but that's it mm -hmm. okay thanks Stephanie uh, next is the education committee professional development planning committee with all the teachers then we'll hear more about what they decided and what their work will be through the year so okay. all right thanks uh, Linda and Sherry all right then next is the personnel committee uh, no updates since uh, our last meeting two weeks ago around the strategic plan um, but potentially some more next meeting at the next cow okay thanks Wes uh, then next is the Finance Committee. Uh, no updates except that uh, we're going to vote later on making a uh, transfer for our final debt payment in November. So, All right. Now that's worth the celebration. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks, David. Uh, and last is the uh, Facilities Committee. Not too much. We are working on setting up a meeting probably next Monday confirm some times and people may have noticed there were some emergency equipment out by Hollywood this weekend and uh, gas main was hit and contractors do everything they can and the utilities do everything they can to try and avoid conflicts but um, it does happen and our owner's rep was out there right away and everything's, everything's fine. Okay. So I, I think that was uh, at least the initial indication was that that was the subcontractor was it, at fault it, there. Honestly, it doesn't. In in this case, it's an underground utility that was not properly either identified or someone wasn't paying attention. Mm -hmm. It's essentially human error, mm -hmm. and they do everything they can to avoid that, but it's human error. Mm -hmm. so. I will say, I was impressed with how quickly Remus was out there and. Yeah. Helping everything to resolve. Mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. And I should add that the new lock went in on the zoo gate. <laughs> all right. Hey, all right. For our staff. Kim Hefner's car was locked at the zoo the night of Paradise. Oh, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> she stayed late and the zoo closed. And so uh, I gave her a ride to work the next morning. Oh. <laughs> oh. Uh, well, that does that brings us to old business. Uh, the first item under old business 
uh, is the approval of the Riverside Educational Education Council Agreement. Uh, at this time, is there a motion to approve the Riverside Education Council Agreement as presented? So moved. Second. All right. Is there any discussion? You, you want to? Uh, so Joel and I, as, as everybody here knows, but just for a uh, refresher here, Joel and I were part of the, the two board members that were part of a large committee to go through negotiations with the REC, and uh, we're thrilled that we're at this point of uh, getting a, a pretty overwhelming ratification. Um, I think we, we had some really good dialogue over several weeks of Zoom meetings, and back and forth and, and really trying to get into what was important to all of the parties involved and, and how do we move forward with it. And I think even beyond this contract, I think there was uh, a lot of dialogue around like non-contractual things that kind of feed into a lot of this that were taken away, like good takeaways of just things we could do different that are evolved through how we engage uh, with administration and staff and all these other things. So I think overall it was, it was uh, really really good dialogue to to get at some of the undercoatings and, and a lot of this stuff fit directly in the strategic plan um but it, i think overall I, I was i was pretty happy with the end of it I, I think joel and i kind of touched base with it and we thought um it was a pretty fair deal and and hopefully with the the numbers that the ratification came out to hopefully that's that is an indication of similar sentiment on the other side but um yeah i think overall it was a really good process i'd agree we had a, a good is too loud. Um, we had a good opportunity to meet with the the rep and their representatives are here right now and this was a we talked as Wesley said both contractual issues and then some cultural issues that maybe fit within and trying to define how how best to um, document and memorialize and build trust and um, look to promote uh, teacher engagement and teacher learning and get everybody on the same page and it was it was very good discussion even though it was on zoom and many evenings of that discussion and then there's a we're going through a joint statement process right now too just to kind of hit on that of kind of releasing some broader stuff I, I think we're Still kind of figuring out exactly how to do that, but right now I think we'll do just like a, a joint statement between REC and, and the district, and then I think we're going to do, uh, I'm sure Mr. Skolnick will be uh, digging through the however many pages of the contract it is to, to do his own analysis, but we've got kind of a summary of some of the main points or some of the key issues that we would like to kind of share with the community, um, I guess in relation to kind of goal four here, the, the family and community partnerships, just like providing that transparency and that communication to parents within the district. But then, you know, we can, the landmark will get to that broader base of people that kind of pay attention to what we do and everything. So trying to look through different mechanisms of communicating this and kind of celebrating this and, and making people um, that are interested aware. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, thanks to everybody involved in that process. It was a lot of, a lot of time, a lot of meetings, yeah. a lot of Zoom, uh, so much. For, so I'm very thankful that I was not uh, on that committee <laughs> to do it. Uh, <laughs> but also, I think it, it's, it's, it is a, a great sign for all of us that I, I think uh, we've heard several times that uh, these things always go into overtime. These things always go and keep going into the year. and. and I think by you know the the original calendar we should still be hammering and negotiating rather than voting on an agreement now so I think that's a great step for everybody that we're able to get this done um, you know essentially before the school year starts yeah. or just as the school year is starting and, and as you can appreciate being part of the strategic plan it would have been much easier I think if we had been able to get together in person those mm -hmm. Talking through a computer for several hours over several weeks is just, it's, it, that alone is exhausting. Well, I'll try to go through the content, so. Um, but four years from now, hopefully we can <laughs> do that in person the next go around. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just want to iterate, I want to um, thank Joel and Wesley for participating. It was a lot of hours, mm -hmm. a lot of Zoom hours. Um, I know the board members will participate another year, so uh, again, thank you very much. And I know Brad and Jeff are here from the REC, and I want to thank them also um, that it really was a good process. And Dan, you mentioned that we didn't go into overtime. That was something I learned that is 
common here that things go well into the fall of the new school year and I think it felt great to have this done and ready and teachers can get their increased paychecks and all that um, after the board approves it tonight hopefully so uh, anyway it's um, it, it was a really good process and as you both said we were examining things that weren't just about the financial parameters and they weren't just about health insurance they were really about the working conditions and how do we make this um, an even better place for um, our, our educational staff to work and do great things for kids because we're supporting them along the way. So really good process. Thank you again. I think with that, we have our REC members here. To, we kind of shuffled the agenda around a little bit so that they would have an opportunity to make a comment here. We did, yes. So uh, I suppose we need a vote first. We <laughs> do have a vote, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, we do have, should have a vote. Uh, any, any further comments? Um, only thank you again for you two and you two. Yeah. And whoever else is on the committee, it's a lot of hours. And most importantly, our staff is, is literally one of the most important expense. I mean, without you guys, our kids wouldn't be where they are. So thank you so much. <laughs> and the rest of the staff. Okay. All right. Well, uh, at this time, uh, let's see. Uh, Kathy, can you call the roll? Mr. Muirhead? Aye. Ms. Gunn? Aye. Ms. Kleiber? Aye. Ms. Murphy? Aye. Mr. Marhol? Aye. Mr. Barsadi? Aye. And Mr. Hunt? Aye. The motion passes. All right. Yeah. And yes, definitely. Okay, as was mentioned, uh, our next uh, item on the agenda is the Riverside Education right. Council. Uh, I'm Jeff Wydra. I teach fourth grade at Ames School. I'm Brad Meyer. I teach band at Hauser. And as the new co-presidents of the REC, we are so pleased to report that the Riverside Education Council has voted in favor of our tentative agreement by a large margin, 111 to 14. Um, we are so encouraged by these numbers and look forward to implementing and upholding this contract for the next four years. Uh, we'd like to thank Wesley and Joel. It's nice to meet you in person <laughs> and look about the, the screen. Uh, and the administration team for their time, collaboration, and focus. This really allowed the negotiation process to conclude. I think at the end of June we concluded, which was light years ahead of what former contracts in this district yes. have been. So thank you for that. And just thank you again for helping the union in, in meeting the needs of the prof and professional needs of our staff and our teachers and everyone involved. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. And I explained to Brad and Jeff they might want to leave at this point. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They'll be back teaching kids tomorrow morning. So. So they will. Yeah. Thanks so much again. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, so the next item then is old business continued. We have the first one, the authorization transferring from transportation to maintenance. And we're taking this off the agenda this right. evening due to the previously mentioned uh, changes in in, um, in uh, legislative or uh, due to leg legislative uh, inaction, I guess. Right. Uh, so that brings us then to the resolution of directing school treasurer to transfer funds from the operations and maintenance fund to the capital projects fund. Uh, at this time, is there a motion? Uh, let's. Yes, is there a motion that the board approve the resolution directing the school treasurer to transfer 800,000 from the operations and maintenance fund to the capital projects fund as presented? So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? Um, I mean, we've, we've transferred funds before. I guess the big thing, um, obviously, that, that amount we're transferring today is not um, the full amount, but between the two transfers we're going to make, it will be paid towards uh, paying, making them last payment on our debt services. So after mm -hmm. that, uh, uh, the total debt services is just over a million dollars, um, and we'll make that final payment in November. So I don't know, Jim, if you have anything to add, but. So we'll, we'll get to that second one. I think that's a separate resolution. Right, but, but uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, if you look at the numbers, it's not the exact amount. It's split. Oh, yeah. yes, yes, yeah. I got you. Jim, anything to add? Uh, no, that's good. 
approved the 800000 then it'll pay the upcoming construction bill. So okay. Then we'll come back and do the rest of the budget Perfect. when we learn the new way to do it. Okay. Right. Sounds good. Uh, any further discussion? All right, uh, Kathy, can you call the roll? Okay, Ms. Gunn? Aye. Ms. Kleiber? Aye. Ms. Murphy? Aye. Mr. Marhol? Aye. Mr. Barsadi? Aye. Mr. Muirhead? Aye. And Mr. Hunt? Aye. Motion passes. All right, uh, next is uh, the it, Let's see. Next is the directing the school treasurer to transfer funds from the educational fund to the debt service fund, as David was mentioning. Uh, at this time, is there a motion that the board approve the resolution directing the school treasurer to transfer $1,091,356 of funds from the educational fund to the debt service fund as presented? So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? Glad it's being done. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. They're like you're supposed to burn a mortgage or something. Yeah, like that. you're supposed to do something. <laughs> <after. laughs> November. November. <laughs> November. We'll do it. Okay. It'll be cold then. So yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, Kathy, can you call the roll? Okay. Ms. Kleiber. Aye. Ms. Murphy. Aye. Mr. Marhol. Aye. Mr. Barsadi. Aye. Mr. Mayorhead? Aye. Ms. Gunn? Aye. And Mr. Hunt? Aye. Motion passes. All right. Uh, the next item is the second reading of Press Plus 107 update memo. So at this time, is there a motion that the board approve the Press Plus 107 update memo as presented? So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? All right, if not, Kathy, can you call the roll? Check 13 policies, okay. Uh, Ms. Murphy? Aye. Mr. Marhol? Aye. Mr. Barsati? Aye. Mr. Mirhead? Aye. Ms. Gunn? Aye. Ms. Kleiber? Aye. And Mr. Hunt? Aye. Motion passes. Okay, uh, next is the Press 107 policies needing five-year review. So at this time, is there a motion uh, that the board, uh, boy, I don't have text in front of me, I'm running into trouble. Is there a motion that the board uh, approve the Press 107 policies needing five-year five -year review as presented? So moved. Second. Is there any discussion on these? All right, if not, Kathy, can you call the roll? Okay, Mr. Marhol? Aye. Mr. Barsati? Aye. Mr. Mirhead? Aye. Ms. Gunn? Aye. Ms. Kleiber? Aye. Ms. Murphy? Aye. And Mr. Hunt? Aye. Motion passes. Okay, uh, next, is there any additional public comment? There is not. All right, uh, then that brings us to future meeting dates. Uh, October 6, 2021, Committee of the Whole, 7 p.m. in the Multipurpose Room at Ames Elementary. And October 20th, 2021, Regular Business Meeting at 7 p.m. in the Multipurpose Room at Ames Elementary. The Board will enter into closed session at 6.15 p.m. if necessary and return to open session if necessary at 7 p.m. Uh, not if necessary, so return to open session at 7 p.m. All right, uh, and that will bring us to, uh, we're anticipating move going back into closed session, uh, but for no action afterwards. Uh, so at this time, is there a motion? Let me get back to the beginning. All right. Okay, so at this time, is there a motion that the board enter into closed session to discuss uh, security procedures 
and the use of personnel and equipment to respond to an actual threatened or reasonably, reasonably potential danger. So moved. And also collective bargaining. I'm sorry? Collective bargaining. Collective bargaining, okay. We, I'm sorry, let me, re, let me start over then. At this time, is there a motion uh, that the board go into closed session for the purpose of discussing collective negotiating matters between the district and its employees or their representatives? or deliberations concerning salary schedules for one or more classes of employees and security procedures and the use of personnel and equipment to respond to an actual threatened or reasonably potential danger. So moved. Second. All right, Kathy, can you call the roll? Okay, Mr. Barsati? Aye. Mr. Mirhead? Aye. Ms. Gunn? Aye. Ms. Kleiber? Aye. Ms. Murphy? Aye. Mr. Marhold? Aye. Aye. Okay, 745, 47.